Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear viewers from all around the world, welcome to another edition of Book Review. And indeed, this is a very special edition. I'm very excited. We have a very special guest and a very special book to talk about, which is On Translating the Quran. Uh, this is a special book, a unique book uh, with a lot of information in it. So we hope indeed to make more than one episode. And we're very pleased to have our esteemed guest, Dr. Muhammad Fauzi, uh, he, who holds a PhD uh, and also is really a, a, a well-known leading figure in this field. Uh, in this book, you will discuss the problems and methodologies used to try to to translate the Quran and render it uh, closest to the original Arabic as possible. Of course, this is a, a massive and huge academic work that has been, t been taken over, which has been, you know, many scholars have endeavored in this field. Uh, so we're going to take his experience and advice and listen to him uh, regarding this issue and uh, regarding translating the noble Quran. Dr. Muhammad, thank you for being with me. Salaamu Alaikum. Welcome to the program. Wa Alaikum Salaam Wa Rahmatullahi Welcome, brother. Th to be with you. Thank you, Doctor. In, in all honesty, this is one of my, I'm very excited about this book. I think this is a huge topic. Um, yes. So perhaps before we get into the book, you can tell the viewers a little bit about yourself and how and why you chose this, 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 this field to get into. Well, uh, first of all, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh. In the name of God, the All Merciful, the Ever Merciful, peace be with you, everybody. Uh, as you know, uh, Quranology or Quranic sciences or um, the Quranic texts is, you know, uh, a field of uh, a field that attracts uh, so many researchers to work on. Why? Because, as we said, you know, before uh, in another episode. Uh, the Quranic text is considered to be is considered to be the model of perfection in Arabic language on different levels, semantic, pragmatic, stylistic, and so forth. So, to translate the Quranic text is, of course, you know, uh, is not an easy task, as you know, and it needs a vast knowledge of different things uh, related to uh, fields of uh, meanings, that is, semantics related to fields of uh, context of situations uh, that is you know pragmatics uh, and I'm not sure if the viewer know about this term this terminology or not but let me uh, explain them you know later okay so uh, I found that uh, I translating the Quranic text is some kind of a big challenge not only for me but even for uh, researchers all yeah. over the world as you know so uh, I opted for uh, two different uh, topics uh, to work on as a researcher. The first topic is repetition or repetitive structures and how far they are uh, difficult to translate or to render into uh, English language. Uh, and the other topic is uh, problems of translating what is called an Arabic uh, language that is, you know, uh, the non-appellative or non-informative linguistic structures. Okay. So later we can discuss, discuss this. It. Okay. And doctor, just to clarify, how many years have you been working on this project? I mean, how many years did it, did it take you to put together this, uh, <coughs> this book, this work? Well, uh, you can say that we, uh, or I started in uh, 2000, uh, 2001 uh, and finished... Um, uh, 2007 or uh, okay. uh, 2008. So okay. <coughs> well, if we could begin now speaking about the book, on, on page 5 here you have the table of contents. In chapter 1, uh, it, it's titled Repetition in the Quran and its problems on rendering into English. <coughs> and you have quite a lot of sub-chapters here. It's quite an extensive chapter and there's a lot of information here. Yes. Why is this topic so important? What is included in this part? And why did you put it first in the book? Repetition in the Quran, it didn't seem perhaps for the lay person like myself and the viewers, repetition in the Quran, it didn't seem perhaps uh, very important. Uh, why, 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 why did you choose to, to allocate so much uh, effort and uh, space here in your book? Uh, well, uh, first of all, let me clarify a very important thing. Uh, some people <coughs> think that the word repetition is, naked, is negative, you know, it's a negative word. Yeah, right. It refers to some kind of reiterating meanings or saying the same thing yes. as, as it is. No, in Arabic language, the word repetition is one of the linguistic or rhetorical terms used in both the Quranic sciences or chronology and uh, Arabic rhetoric. Okay. Even it is used as a linguistic and rhetorical device in English language and literature. Okay. So uh, repetition is, um, does not 
uh, necessarily refer to the repetition of meanings. No, sometimes okay. it refers, it is just uh, called repetition superficially. But inside, when you go inside the, the linguistic structure, you, f you find that the meanings are different or this kind of repetition is done uh, to achieve some kind of rhetorical, uh, rhetorical or a semantic peps. And that's why uh, some scholars in Arabic, uh, you know, uh, literature and language, and even in the field of Quranic sciences, uh, say, uh, say, أَبْلَغُ مِنَ التأكيد. This is Al Imam Al Suyuti. Imam Al Suyuti, yes, says, وَهُوَ أَبْلَغُ مِنَ التأكيد وَهُوَ مِنْ مَحَاسِنْ الْفَصَاحَةِ. He says, uh, repetition is more rhetorical, more eloquent than emphasis. So I emphasis, see. you know, yeah. I, in, in English language, in Arabic language, is a linguistic device. Yeah. You know, we ha in, in linguistics, for instance, we say uh, emphasis, we say emphasizers, emphatic yes. uh, structures. Yeah. Uh, and that's why th the same linguistic phenomena is there in Arabic language. So he says, وَهُوَ أَبْلَغُ مِنَ الْفَصَاحَةِ It is more eloquent than emphasis. So we can understand that repetition according to or for uh, religious scholars is not something to be shamed of. Okay. Then he says, وَهُوَ مِنْ مَحَاسِنِ الْفَصَاحَةِ It is one of the linguistic and rhetorical, you know, subtleties or beauties or uh, devices that beautify the words you say, the expressions you use the style you have. You know, this means what? It means uh, when words are repeated for some purpose, they are confirmed. Okay. So you reach the point quickly. Okay, thank you, doctor. And actually, before we continue in chapter one, I wanted to ask you something in the beginning, <coughs> but it slipped my mind. And that is oftentimes when someone in the Western world purchases the Quran in English, it will say the translating meanings of the Qur'an. And this sounds very strange in the English language, and I can't quite understand what they mean by that. And I was told later this is because the Qur'an cannot be translated, so we say this is the translating meanings of the Qur'an. Is that a correct translation? Can you, can you shed some light on that? Uh, as I said, you know, translating the Qur'anic text is, you know, uh, a complicated process. And that's why in the field of translation for, for scholars, we call, um, we, you know, we call it the process of translation. This process uh, includes s different elements. Uh, some elements are related to uh, the, uh, the text itself. This is you know, called uh, intralinguistic elements. That is what is related to uh, the style, to the choice of words, to uh, the syntactic structures. Um, then we have extra linguistic elements like the interpretation itself, the different interpretations uh, or the different views of uh, meanings itself inside the Quranic text. So of course translating it, translating the Quranic text is not an easy task and that's why the word the translation itself means rendering simp in simple words, and uh, this is not an academic, you know, it means rendering the meanings of something that you do not understand. Okay. So the act of translating itself entails that this is something different from the original. Okay. We just a translator tries as much as possible to render what he or she can, uh, you know, render uh, f uh, from the uh, Quranic meanings. So it's 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 something you know uh, that's tiring, of course. Doctor, you had mentioned an interesting tori uh, story before the episode regarding the Sheikh of Azhar University in 1935. And you had mentioned <coughs> to me that the word Tarjumet al Quran, this poses problems <coughs> in the Arabic language, and this is reflected in the English translation. Can, can you speak about that? You had mentioned that. Ah, yeah, I told you uh, before about the, you know, the problematic term, the translation of the Qur'an or the translation of the meanings of the Qur'an. Then I told you a story about uh, that happened, you know, in uh, 1935 uh, 35 or something like that, uh, at the age of uh, the Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar, uh, Mustafa Al-Maraghi. You know, uh, when the issue of translating the the Quran or the Quranic text, you know, started. Uh, they uh, and, and to be and to become um, more famous. They were, you know, between the horns of a dilemma: whether to say the translation of the meanings of the Quran in English or the translation of 
uh, the Quran uh, um, without the word meanings. Mm -hmm. But as I told you, the word translation itself in English means yes. rendering the meanings of something. Yes. But because this may cause some problems in Arabic language, yeah. they opted to, uh, to put the word meanings in English. Yeah. But of course, when I say this is a translation, this means this is my trial a personal yes. trial to render the meanings. Yes, so certainly. it is uh, something different from the original uh, itself. And that's why you will find that some sheikhs or some uh, uh, scholars uh, feel some kind of embarrassed when uh, they ask it, is it the translation or the translation of <laughs> the meanings? Of right, right. Uh, Doctor, we have to take a short break. When we get back, I would like to continue uh, and explore in your book. And also, I, I would li like to ask you uh, other important questions regarding this, uh, this issue that come to mind uh, regarding translating the Quran. Um, I really enjoy your time. I'm having a wonderful time discussing this with you. And I would like you to answer the next segment if possible. Is there any such thing as an unbiased translation? In other words, does the translator always impose his methodology or ideological beliefs when translating the Quran? This is very important. Inshallah, Ta'ala, I'm going to put you on the hot seat. Pleasure. Okay. okay. You guys, uh, stay tuned for more book review uh, with Dr. Muhammad Fauzi. Uh, we're discussing this wonderful book right here. On, translate, on translating the Quran, which is available indeed on 3ws.amazon.com. So stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Book Review. I'm really excited about this episode. If you're just tuning in, we're discussing on translating the Quran uh, with Dr. Muhammad Fauzi, a, a prominent uh, acad uh, ac uh, scholar in this field. Uh, we talk about a lot of interesting topics regarding the problems uh, when translating the Quran into any language, specifically English. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, thank you for staying with me. I'm really pleased that you're here with me, and I want you to answer the following question. When any translator translates this book with so many meanings and understandings, this divine book, is it possible to simply translate this book without imposing my ideological beliefs? For is it, is it even possible? Is it even is it even possible for any human to do such a thing? Go ahead. Uh, well, this is really a very interesting question. You you're asking me about you know whether the ideology of a translator can affect uh, his linguistic style or his way of translating meanings themselves. Certainly. Yes, th that's true. Uh, it's uh, difficult, you know, for a translator to uh, separate, you know, between what his belief uh, sometimes and uh, the, the meanings th th that he or she choose. Um, and that's why um, in recent, you know, uh, translations of the Quranic text, uh, there is a translation entitled or uh, named uh, feminist Quranic translation. Is that, is that right? Yes, and this of course uh, shows the, <laughs> the dilemma of, uh, you know, um, of uh, ideological yeah. uh, based or ideology based <laughs> translations. And even you will find that the, uh, the Shia translations are different from yes. the Sunnites translations. Yes. Of course, um, uh, any translator has a specific ideology. Um, in translation studies, we try to be fair. We try to be, you know, neutral uh, to just to translate the meaning as it is, or to translate the text as it is. But of course, in so many times, it is difficult for a translator to detach himself from the certainly his, uh, the, his ideology or the things that he believes in. Of course, Doctor, you had mentioned something interesting on page twelve. Uh, you wrote here. Right here, it's very interesting. You said the reason for this choice stems mainly from the fact that the Quranic text is difficult to interpret through focusing on one aspect only, textual or contextual, linguistic or rhetorical, especially on taking into account that the Quranic text is characterized by generating viable meanings that suit different times and different times. So my question, doctor, <coughs> it seems impossible to, to impose or to use one methodology when translating this noble book because there's so many different meanings and context and understandings, uh, superficial perhaps meanings, deeper meanings. So how does how does someone like yourself uh, address and, and approach this huge task? Uh, yes, uh, let me as I as, as I mentioned here, there are different aspects that we work on. Take for instance the aspect of sound itself. The Quranic text is characterized by the beauteous sounds. 
especially at the end of uh, of each Quranic verse. This is, you know, some kind uh, called uh, uh, rhythmical schemes. Yeah. Okay, the 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 Quranic chapter of a tour, for example, uh, ends like that. What tour? What tour? في رق منشور والبيت المعمور. See the rhythm, yeah. you know the rhythmical, the rhythmical um, endings of the of the verses themselves are very, you know, beautiful. Uh, beautiful. So translating that is of course impossible. Uh, something impossible, or at least you know some Quranic translators like Arthur John Arbery, you know has tried to do that but of course w this is still a trial and this is only one aspect as i told you uh, let's move to another aspect that is the aspect of uh, meanings uh, allah says in uh, in the quranic chapter sad uh, about the story of solomon and uh, the story of uh, the prophet david uh, peace be upon them you know, peace be upon them uh, all um, it is a Quranic verse about uh, Prophet Solomon. إذ عرض عليه بالعشي الصافنات الجياد. This is, you know, some kind of a story that happened with uh, the Prophet Solomon uh, when he was, you know, worshiping God, and he, uh, you know, he was watching the coursers or uh, coursers. By the way, in English, as you know, means <laughs> uh, the fast horses. Yes. So he was uh, watching the the the, uh, the speedy or the you know Fast the horses. horses you know that um, um, that run uh, quickly. This distracted him from an act of worship. So he felt sorry. So the the Quranic uh, text, the Quranic verse uh, depicts this uh, picture, but it uses a very interesting word that um, that has no. Equivalent in other, you know, in other languages, yeah. the word asafinat. It is a picture in itself. Okay. If I tell you now uh, its meanings, you are going to be amazed. Asafinat uh, al asafin, when the horse stands on three legs and lift the fourth one. Subhanallah. Yes. Very detailed, specific. Yes, and fourth. So this stuff you cannot translate. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, so the word itself, you know, the word itself depicts a very beauteous, a very beautiful yeah. picture that is difficult to be rendered into English. So I myself try to translate this word as the beautifully standing coursers. Something like so that. So um, let me emphasize that coursers means uh, horses here. Okay. But fast horses. So this is another level, as I told you, yeah. the level of meaning. This is another problem. Yes. If you add this problem to the problem yeah. of sounds, yeah. so how come? But doctor, I wanted to ask you regarding the, the, the beauty of the, of the sound of the Quran itself when recited, as you recited now, yeah. this is something unique and special uh, that, cannot be, that cannot be duplicated or replicated in any other language. So do you think it's wise for a translator to even try to render its beautiful sound into another language, or it's better just to, it's better to, to not try to do that uh, i think he uh, he or she as a translator you know uh, should try to do that as much okay. as possible to beautify why, it. why okay. not okay. and you know there is a quranic verse where abdullah yusuf ali or muhammad marmad of uh, have tried to do that it is the verse which he says tabbat yada abi lahabi wa tab see yes. the, the the two words here tabba and tab they said perish the hands of the father of the flame or abu lahab perish he or and he perished right so right. they tried to make some kind of you to know it echoing the uh, the text good word echoing yeah thank you doc yeah. now if we can go back to uh, chapter one uh you have 1.1 the quranic text liter literary and rhetorical uh can you shed some light uh, on, on that uh how yes. do you approach that um, i think this is a, 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 all these topics are very um Mm. Uh, lend itself to different kind of interpretations from different groups of people. So how can you, uh, literary and rhetorical, uh, talk about that? Uh, well, uh, we say that the um, there are different levels of uh, eloquence in the Quranic text, uh, literary and rhetorical. 
uh, as an expression here refers to the uh, different linguistic, the different linguistic and rhetorical uh, styles or methods of uh, expressing uh, meanings. Uh, take, for instance, uh, something that is called um, in Arabic language and um, and rhetoric a uh, tabdia or uh, antimitable in English language. Yes, you know it is to uh, to say something, then to say it again in a specific arrangement to make some kind of you know I influence on okay. the uh, the readers or the hearers uh, eyes or even ears. Uh, ears. Okay. So uh, Allah says in the in the Quran وَمَن يُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ وَيُخْرِجُ وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ So who is he that can you know brings out the living from the dead and the dead right. from the living okay so this is in itself depicts a, a picture in front of your eyes but here this kind of changing places of uh, of words is in itself a rhetorical device a rhetorical device that needs uh, great uh, experience on the part of the translator to to even try to render the beauty of writing itself the beauty of you yeah. know of words the beauty of arrangement yeah. and even to stir some kind of uh, some kind of attractiveness on the part of uh, the reader or uh, the hearer uh, the idea of, um, you know, uh, the idea of uh, style itself or the rhetorical devices that is related to style consists in uh, the form plus the content or the meaning plus th the form itself. So uh, in, the, uh, in this verse, uh, Allah says, يخرج الحي من الميت to bring us out right, the and يخرج الميت مِنَ الْحَيِّ In other verses, uh, God says يُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ وَمُخْرِج You see the difference? يُخْرِج is a verb. مُخْرِج is a participial form, you know, yes. in, in language. So, of course, it is... Uh, Lends a different meaning yeah, somehow. Yes, of course. In Arabic, they are different and they have uh, different connotations. Okay. Hey, thank you, doctor. Let's move to 1.11, repetition in Arabic grammar and rhetoric. I believe that you had mentioned, if we can just briefly recap, uh, repetition is not a negative thing, it's a positive thing that lends itself to emphasis, uh, which you had quoted Sheikh Jalaluddin and Asuki <coughs> on that, actually. Yes. And also repetition in, in one, 1 1.12, repetition in English rhetoric. Uh, does it lend itself the same way? Is repetition in English rhetoric the same as in Arabic rhetoric? Or Let's talk about that. Uh, well, each language, as you know, has its own uh, repetitive forms has its own rhetorical and linguistic devices and uh, Leach for instance who is you know a famous um, linguist and uh, uh, working in the field of you know English language and uh, and rhetoric uh, talks about different forms of uh, repetition or repetitive or repetitive structures in English and that's why uh, we, as you know, specialists in uh, in this field, try to make some kind of uh, you know a comparison between the repetitive structures in Arabic and the repetitive structures in English to uh, uh, to see if it is possible to uh, to reach to reach you know the meaning or to reach the best uh, translations sure. uh, in something you know in a way that is uh, close to the to the target reader or. To sure. the English reader, you know. Okay, uh, wonderful, so. Doctor. You've chosen now, as as uh, sub to, in, the, in your analysis of translation of the Quran, you've discussed uh, three main translations. Uh, so, inshallah ta'ala, in the next episode, I would like you to discuss why you have picked these three uh, translations in, in particular, and why you you left uh, other translations uh, out of your analysis, and we can go on and discuss uh, further elements uh, regarding the the the, the problematic. Uh, uh, the, the problems of translating the Quran 
Thank you so much for your time, Doctor. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you guys at home for staying tuned. Uh, don't forget to pick up this book, On Translating the Quran, by Dr. Muhammad Fauzi. We've had a wonderful discussion regarding the problems of rendering the Quran and its meanings into the English language. Uh, we certainly hope to have him back in a future episode uh, to continue our discussions. Uh, until next time, I do, in fact, leave you in the care of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.